Quite the saga in Gainesville. Welcome into the Voice of College Football, breaking down Florida football. And of course, when you break down Florida football, you go to Gators Breakdown and David Waters. David, how are you doing today? Good, Mark. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's broken down. Uh, so, <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> the, the 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 name the name fit the name fits right now. Absolutely, it does. It was in, intended in another for another. Way. Yeah, yeah, intended yeah, for yeah. another use originally, and <laughs> usually is. But uh, here we stand. Uh, I will start with this. I don't know that there is another program in college football where the two names of the quarterback and the um, the coach uh, are pretty much everything that anyone is talking about. And so we'll start with the coach, of course, Billy Napier. Okay, many people expected, especially after what we heard about board of trustees meeting and so forth on Sunday that uh, they would pull the plug and he would not be coaching this game in Mississippi state. Um, just your thoughts about whether it's a done deal. It's just a matter of days or whether they're going to continue to see how this team progresses the next couple of weeks. I don't think it's uh, the latter Mark. I don't think they're waiting to see if, if it can turn around. Um, I think, I do. If you had to ask me, I do think it will take part after this Mississippi State game. Florida has a bye week after that, so if you decide to turn the page, it's just a whole lot easier to turn the page then. I don't think there's any coming back from it, uh, Mark. The, the money's raised, a twenty-six million dollar buyout. The, the money's there. Uh, their boost, you know, the, the boosters are certainly ready to move on uh, and are you know, <laughs> have let it since the Miami game, pretty let it be known that, Hey, this, this isn't going to work. Uh, and then take this A&M, which is further confirmation of that. So, uh, yeah, Mark, I, if you had to ask me to put a timeline on it, I'd say if we were to get together early next week, Billy Napier won't be the head coach of Florida. Now we'll see. Uh, I think there's a, a, maybe he does get fired and finishes out the season. I can, I can see that scenario uh, at the same time. But I would not be surprised next weekend, we or this coming up weekend, we get the word that Billy Napier would no longer be moving on as head coach for Florida starting in 2025. Now, had we known at this point in the season, Florida would be one and two. Nobody would be surprised. But at the same time, if we knew they were one and two and they had performed the way they did against Miami and Texas A&M and did not lose one score games to teams that they should be competitive with, but lost in the manner that they did. This is obviously not a good look for where this program's headed. I looked at a couple different sources this week, check in with you at times, and it appears as though everything else with this program seems to be running well. And I know if you're not winning on the field, nobody cares about that, but it seems like the players respect the coach. They like him. They show up on time. They do their work. They're not getting in trouble all those things. There doesn't seem to be a bad attitude on the field. They seem to support him. He claims Billy Napier that he's doing those things behind the walls that, that show that he's building a program. Uh, but obviously it's got to translate to the field, uh, pretty much immediately, or he's actually probably past that line. Yeah. Mark, there's a disconnect somewhere. Uh, you know, Napier has said many times, uh, in the last couple of weeks, hey, whatever I see on the practice field Monday through Thursday, for whatever reason, we don't see it on Saturday. And it's a surprise to him. Well, that, that can be a problem in and of itself. Either he just can't identify <laughs> what a good football team in the SEC looks like, or that actually is the case. And for whatever reason, it just doesn't translate on Saturdays. Either way, it's a problem. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, Mark, there, there is a good culture there. It's not a winning culture. Uh, and that, that to me, that's the best way to break it down. Uh, and, and that's all that matters. You know, the wins and losses are all that matters, uh, in, in the end. And, you know, it, it's, the, as you you know, there's not a lot of players in trouble, uh, under Billy Napier, uh, as you said, uh, you know, the big thing taking over for Dan Mullen was, you know, getting the, the, the players to, you know, want to be at Florida, enjoy being at Florida, fix parking situations, fix strength and conditioning, fix you, nutrition, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and a lot of those things have happened, uh, but it just does not translate uh, to to um, to wins on Saturday. And, and you know, speaking of Saturday, it, it's just Mark. I think you can just say it, if all those other things are true, it just lets you know probably how bad of a game day coach Billy Napier is. I mean, there's no feel for a game. The defense is in his third season bad once again, but for Florida, 
now going on five seasons of bad defensive football. Uh, he not, has not been able to fix that side of the ball. Uh, the offense has seemed to regress in some ways when, to me, it really shouldn't have with a returning quarterback, what you have at receiver, uh, what you have at running back. The offensive line, much like the defense, just has gotten worse uh, under Billy Napier. So it's not a very tough team, Mark. Uh, I think that really what takes Gator Nation off a, a whole lot. You can see it in the trenches versus Miami. You can see it in the trenches versus Texas A&M. Um, so it doesn't matter how good it is behind the scenes, Mark. It just uh, – it just does not translate into wins and losses for Billy Napier. Okay. There is also a line of thinking to a certain extent, and this is me just thinking on the surface that maybe it's a little bit more than Billy Napier. If you look at the history of this program, sure, it's a highly successful program, but that's pretty much been Steve Spurrier and Urban Meyer. They have reached the heights of the heights, and they have pretty much been the responsibility of the entire cachet of this entire history of this program. Sure, they had some nice teams in the 80s, but basically it's been Spurrier and Meyer. And ever since Urban Meyer stepped off campus, they've made four coaching hires. Dan Mullen, we could have a debate as to whether he was successful. He, of course, had three really good seasons. Um, they've had four hires. And if I've got these dates correct, Scott Strickland's been the AD since, I believe, 2016. So mm -hmm. he's responsible for three of these hires. Or maybe it's just the last two. Uh, yeah, he did not hire McElwain, so okay. he hired Mullen and Napier. Okay, so he's only had two. And again, Mullen just had the one bad season, and then there were all the off-the-field things that contributed to his dismissal. But uh, is is there anything outside of just Billy Napier being the problem that could be more systemic? I still think it starts there, Mark, because I do think there is more talent on this team. And no, don't get me wrong. It is not championship level talent. Nobody has ever you know, stood by that, but it's better than what we've seen. Uh, but as you kind of go and mention and, and kind of the, the litany of head coaches Florida has had, I mean, yeah, everybody wants to point to the university, university athletic association and how Florida, you know, kind of got arrogant in the nineties with Spurrier and a little bit with Meyer as well. And just, didn't really feel the need to keep up with the times. You know, Florida fell behind in the arms race, the facilities, and by the time they got their Taj Mahal facility, everybody already had it, and the page had turned to NIL uh, in Transfer Portal. Uh, and then Florida kind of got off. While the first collective in the country with the Gator Collective, now Florida Victorious, um, it just wasn't – there was not a lot of support by the UAA and the administration. They were slow to take hold – of what NIL and how important it was going to be uh, to build a college football roster and build a college football program. Uh, and, you know, Florida Victorious now has just gotten up to that level uh, to be, I think, you know, a, a top 10, top 15 collective in the country. Uh, but it was, they're slow to come around on it. I still don't think a lot of the, the old guard has come around on just how important NIL is. You know, they, they want it to be the old way, and they want to hang on to that. They'd rather have a coach that they could be buddies with and take photos with and have a yes man, and that's just not what is needed in today's college football. Uh, so – yeah, it's not all Billy Napier. It is on Saturdays and what we see. that That's the problem, Mark. Uh, but if Florida's ever going to reach that pinnacle of being a national championship program, it is more than just a head coach. So you mentioned the possibility that Billy Napier could finish out the season but be a fired head coach. What do you think would be the – the, the most optimal decision to be made that would be the best for the health of this program? Would it be, is there a coach on staff that you trust to hand the keys to for the final nine games, eight <laughs> games? That, that's the problem. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, Ron Roberts is not that guy's defensive coordinator. They brought in Dan Enos as a analyst. He's got some head coaching experience, but failed almost every stop he's been at lately. Uh, there's, the only alumni you have on staff is Mike Peterson as your edge, uh, your edge rusher coach. Uh, so, you know, you give him that responsibility when he's never even been a head coach at, at the college level. Jabbar Jaluk is somebody who's been with Billy Napier for a long time. Rob Sell as well. No, Mark, there's nobody qualified. Look, and I, don't get me wrong. I think it's overblown. I mean, once you fire the head coach, does it really matter? <laughs> who the interim is of course you want somebody to maybe the players can rally around and somebody who will look after the players and still put them in the best situations for the games that you have left but in the big picture it doesn't matter 
uh, who, who it's going to be. And uh, so that's the way I, I kind of look at it. But you also don't want somebody to, to, to throw away, you know, what this could mean for the players uh, for the rest of the season. So I think, Mark, if it's presented with Billy Napier and maybe the relationship he's built, he probably hangs on. That's, that's going to be a decision he has to make, too, as well. Um, I do think, Mark, it would be beneficial if you're going to make the move to fire Billy Napier. And whether you keep him on for the rest of the season or not, the decision needs to be made fast because it, it's toxic right now. And you know, we heard all the boos in the swamp. If, those probably won't go away. Whether he's, you know, you make the announcement he's fired or not, it still looks ugly. You know, but there's a mounting pressure, mounting pressure, mounting pressure. It is getting toxic in some ways. Um, I do think you can alleviate alleviate some of that pressure if you say, okay, we are moving on from Billy Napier. So. Um, but I do think maybe from a player perspective now, you could sit there and say, oh, maybe they rally around him. Maybe more, they, they had their opportunities to do that. You know, this team was questioned all offseason against Miami in a back against the wall mentality, wounded dog mood. It didn't show up. And then some people wanted to say, OK, well, it'll show up against Texas A&M. Blah, 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 blah. No, it didn't. You know, the, the, their their opportunity for proving everybody wrong and back against the wall. That, that that's that's past. That's that's gone now. So I don't even think you really get that rallying point of hey, let's go play for Billy Napier. That should have already been done. You know, that, that, you're not going to flip that switch now. So I think there's a lot of ways to look at it. But yeah, you know, I, I I I would not be against it whatsoever if he decides to stay on and coach these players that he's coached. Maybe try something different. Just give all, most responsibility to somebody else, or he just continues down the same path. It doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. And the point that you made about it not mattering, actually in this transfer portal world, it's even more so in that direction. In the past, we would have said, okay, uh, it's a lost season and you hate to watch it go down like this, but at least you can have some semblance of fun as a fan evaluating and you as an analyst evaluating the team, the young players, how are they going to play the rest of the season? Are they going to play this week against Mississippi State? Our freshmen are our sophomore, but you don't know if those guys are going to be around. Well, they they were pretty much stuck to that program in the past, so you could at least evaluate and and just project. Okay, what do we have here? But who knows? Yeah, Mark, and that's why I've been against. You know, there's been this fan narrative. Of, oh, you can't keep firing coaches three three every three four years, or you know, you got to have stability. Stability stability for the sake of stability is not stability in today's college football. It, it's not going going to your point there. Whether you're keeping. For another year, just because okay, let's give him a fourth year, no matter what. Or you decide to you know to move on, the roster's gonna be in flux either way. I mean, I, I don't think there's a lot a lot of if you're if you're a high player who's going to get hit up by DMs and emails and text messages from agents around the country to go to another school. You know, th- th- there's gonna be a lot of players on this roster. If somehow Billy Napier wants to stay, that's gonna transfer away from Florida. Just because they don't believe in the direction of the program. If he's fired, that's going to happen anyway. Now, that's the world we're living in right now. The roster's going to be in flux either way. Now, you make a good next hire. Maybe some of those guys stay. But at the point that we're, we're at right now, yeah, w- with the roster and the way the roster can change, Mark, yeah, there's you know, stability for the sake of stability is not the way to go. Um, and and I'll, I'll say it, and I'll say it again, and Gator fans are probably tired of hearing it, Mark, but it's a hiring problem at Florida not a firing problem. Yeah. And that's what I was trying to point to with the question about Scott Strickland and just the, the number of coaches that have been hired in regards to, and not just laying it on the AD, but the entire administration and posing that question as to whether that could be part of the issue. Uh, DJ Lagway uh, set a school record for freshman passing a couple weekends ago against Sanford 456, I believe was the number. Uh, so that could turn out to be just a footnote in Florida yep. history. If he moves on just, Oh, we never really got a chance, but he set a record and left. Or again, if this was the old days, there would be a buzz of excitement to, okay, this season's lost. We're going four and eight or whatever it's going to be. Uh, but we got DJ Lagway. Um, and it's an impossible question in regards to whether he's going to stick around. That's another importance to this head coaching hire, uh, the credibility of that guy to try to maintain Lagway and other quality players. Yeah, for sure, Mark. Um, I mean, Lagway loves being a Gator. Uh, that That is 
it's obvious if you're close to the program, even behind the scenes, a little bit, he loves being a Florida Gator. I, I do think he would give whoever would be the next hire the chance to talk him into staying. I don't think it would be an automatic, he's gone. Um, he, he likes being a Gator. He loves being in Gainesville. Uh, he was a Gator fan growing up, Gator fan coming to Florida. That's you know one of the major pulls. And don't get me wrong, he was a big Billy Napier fan as well. Uh, so uh, I, don't, I don't think it's a shoe that he stays, uh, a shoe in that he stays. I don't think it's a shoe in that he leaves. I think there's going to be some really realistic conversations going on whether DJ Lagway wants to stay at, at Florida or not. But yeah, Mark, uh, it, it, there's so many ways to look at it. You know, as we talked about right here, transfer portal guys leaving as well. You know, but but the timeline of of getting your next guy in with an expanded playoff and uh, the early signing day and transfer portal. I mean. If you're trying to get an established guy, and that guy, you know, of course, everybody's name goes to Lane Kiffin, or the, the, everybody's top choice for the Florida job in Gator Nation is Lane Kiffin. That's going to be the – not everybody there, but if you take a poll, that's going to be the name that comes up the most. And there's going to be a timeline with that. You know, if Ole Miss makes a playoff, you probably going into January before you can even say he would leave Ole Miss for Florida. Um, now, maybe there's some way an announcement gets made, and he's – but. Does he do that to Ole Miss? Does he agree to a Florida job and say, hey, after whatever happens, even if we go to the national championship game, I'm leaving I'm, I'm, I'm leaving to go to Florida. I don't, I don't necessarily see that happening, but look, you, you look at this, if, if, if Florida wants him to be the guy, they're going to have to wait. And then you're probably going to get that inclination that he's going to be the guy. If Florida doesn't hire, hire somebody in December, you know who the top target is. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a dead giveaway that that's going to be Lane Kiffin. And then if you wait that long and then don't get him, you're probably digging the even deeper of a hole. That doesn't mean you don't make the move. You absolutely make the move to fire Billy Napier. But there's a, a lot of angles to this to where it could dig a hole a little bit deeper. If, you, if you're ready to make a move, you make the move. You, don't make the, you, you do not not make the move because you want to keep players. Or there's a certain timeline. You know, transition classes are mostly a wash anyway. We'll see what the NCAA does with this second transfer portal window. If that doesn't go away, you got an advantage there. But if they get away, if, if that spring portal window goes away and you hire Lane Kiffin, it's going to be very, very tough to build a a roster that could compete maybe right away in year one. He'd have to wait to hit the transfer portal pretty heavy in year two. So, you know, if Lane Kiffin is your guy, which I think he should be. There are some you know, outside circumstances you probably have to look at. Well, David, I think you just uh, hit on a dynamic with this new college football playoff going to 12 teams that hasn't been hit on. And that's the, the coaching carousel, which, of course, the four teams, those four teams are typically elite teams. Those coaches aren't going to be touched, but you broaden it out to 12 and you got these kind of situations that uh, are more probable to arise interesting there because uh, what, 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 when's the first round mark mid mid december december 20th or 20th yeah so you know what's after or that's the week i think it's the week of early signing day right i think yes. early signing day is that wednesday and then there's yeah, first game friday, friday saturday, saturday. yeah yeah so you even if even if he's coaching in that first weekend and loses you are still missing out on your early signing day. Like I said, transition classes are a wash anyway. It, 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 you're, that is not a reason not to make a move on somebody. Don't get me wrong. If he's your guy, he's your guy. But at the same time, you know, it, it just does put another wrinkle into the early stages of building a program. All right, folks. Uh, Florida goes to Mississippi State. If you've ever been in a stadium when there's been this kind of saga, it, it's just an odd, eerie feeling because uh, people aren't really watching, paying attention to the game. They are thinking about what's going to happen with the coach and the team, and it's kind of strange. I don't know what it was like at the Swamp this past weekend, probably something like that, but Some maybe food. a refreshing thing, actually, maybe. Uh, for the team to go on the road and get out of there. Yeah, there was some boo birds, of, of course, going yeah. into – there was the the weather delay, some boo birds going into the locker room, halftime boo birds going into the locker room, and certainly after the game. Uh, Mark, I know you worked in that area. Were you there when – Sylvester Croom upset Ron Zook. I just and, missed and, that by a couple of years. Okay, okay, because you know there's a there's a precedent of Florida coaches going to Starkville and and losing there and and getting fired uh, after that. So 
Could it happen again Saturday? All right. David Waters, Gators Breakdown. That is the destination to be. It's one of the most successful college football podcasts out there. So you can catch it on your favorite audio platform or right here on YouTube. David, appreciate you stay, stopping by, breaking things down for us. Know it's been a rough season for you and the, the Gator faithful. Yeah, for sure. Next time we talk, Mark, who, uh, who knows who'd be head coach of Florida?